Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to this next online worship service from First Parish Church of Kingston, Massachusetts. I am the Reverend Monica Jacobson Tennyson. I serve this church as its minister. This is Jen Shattuck, our Director of Family Ministry. Today we are a church apart, at least six feet apart, but we are also a church together because we remain connected to each other in these times, even amidst the strangeness of social distancing. We would like to invite you to sing our introit with us, to remember that what we need is here, no matter where here is for you today. As a reminder the flame is different every time and in these times we kindle separate flames yet the flame is the same each time and all our separate flames remind us of this community and our shared light please join with us in singing spirit of life We'll sing it through twice. joys and sorrows on Zoom on Sunday mornings. So for today, we have lit candles to represent what it is that we will share, what we have shared in conversations with each other, what we know to be true in our hearts, and what we carry for the world. 
We light some of these candles for the most vulnerable people who are at risk in so many ways. For healthcare providers who are answering the call to help and heal even as they expose themselves to infection. For those who work in what we now know are essential jobs, stocking grocery shelves and delivering orders. For folks who work in retail and restaurants and hospitality and events, who are feeling the impact of lost work. For people who are unhoused or imprisoned or otherwise made vulnerable by their circumstances. And for so many others who need love and care in these times. Please join with me now in a spirit of prayer or meditation or reflection, whatever is the best practice for you, as we share these words from the Reverend Florence Kaplow. On this strange Sunday, we gather in so many ways, linked to each other through the delicate tracery of electrons and through the invisible bonds of caring and love. Sharing with millions the wondering and the fear and the uncertainty of this time, may each of us stay whole and well. May each of us find our ground of strength and clarity. May each of us let our hearts break open to caring for our neighbors as ourselves. May each of us know, even if we are alone, that we are held in a great embrace of love. Let us share a few moments together in silence. everybody. I'm here with Reverend Monica and we are standing very far apart. It feels strange. Hi. Hello. <laughs> but we're practicing social distancing in order to keep each other healthy and safe. We can still work together and talk to each other, but we're just going to do it a little further apart today than we normally would. Yep. This week, I've been thinking a lot about the word comfort. What do you think the word comfort means? Oh, when I think about the word comfort, I think about feeling good, like being comfortable in my bed or feeling comfortable at home. Yeah. Did you know that the word comfort comes from a word that means to make strong? What? So when we're talking about things that comfort us, we're really talking about things that make our hearts and our spirits strong. Well, that makes a lot of sense. If you're tired, if you're feeling really scared, you want something to comfort you. And that gives you more energy to be brave and kind and helpful. That's right. Because you are comforted. I like that. That's right. So we all have things that bring us comfort in dark times or hard times. And I'm holding one of my comfort objects right now. This is Miss Maggie Bunny, and she was made by my mom. And because I'm practicing social distancing right now, I can't see my mom, but I can have Miss Maggie Bunny with me to remind me that I love my mom and my mom loves me. Do you have some comfort objects? I do. I brought my friend Cora. Some of you have met Cora before. She's a lion cub. She's very good for hugging. So right now is a time when maybe there are people you wish you could hug, but you can't hug them. 
that you can find somebody soft and squishy and fuzzy to give a hug to, and that is a source of comfort. We can also have other things that bring us comfort, TV shows or books or music. And I can see you're holding a book right now. I am. I read this book for the first time when I was 12 years old. And it has been a very long time since I was 12 years old. But I think I'm gonna read this book again because it's familiar and it's comforting. And it's a story about people doing hard things to help others. And I think we all need to be reminded right now, we can do hard things to help other people. That's right. And we can comfort others as well. You might be at home right now with your family, or you might be able to, if you're at home alone, be able to reach out to friends or family and help make them strong. Please join us in singing there is more love somewhere. There are little gold stars all amongst the bittersweet. It's all there, mixed together. I had just met with this person, who was not quite in crisis, but dancing on the edge, talking and weeping and raging through one of those hard, hard moments that can last for weeks or months or years. It was painful stuff faced with courage. Here, hours later, was this slightly mysterious, elegant message and I thought how amazing it is that some people can render even the most desperate experience poetically, and what a gift this is, this making of art out of ashes, and how rare. I was very moved. The next day, there came a second message from the same person on the answering machine, slightly altering my view of things. It's me again, calling back about the stars in the bittersweet. I forgot to tell you, I stuffed it all in garbage bags. They're in the closet in the social hall. Those fairies make an awful mess. Well, there's not much poetry in that. As it turns out, there were no metaphor, metaphors at work at all. Before our appointment that morning, this person had been cleaning up after a church party, 
for which the decorations had included branches of bittersweet from members' autumn, gar autumn gardens and long lengths of gold tinsel wire to which tiny metal stars were fixed. So it really was all garbage. But I'm intrigued by conversations and by language that can speak of trash bags, closets, golden stars, and bittersweet, and refer with equal accuracy to the very depths of human hope and suffering or to the details of committee cleanup. And I know that I am called, as I suspect we are all called, to places where the sacred and the ordinary are all mixed up together, where work is prayer and prayer is song, and songs are sacraments, and sacraments are silent or spoken brokenly in messages we sometimes barely comprehend, in words we speak in love to one another and to the golden stars. We've just had the spring equinox. It was March 19th this year. Maybe you know there are two equinoxes in the year, one in the fall and one in the spring, the two days when day and night are exactly the same length. The two days when the sun rises exactly to the east and sets exactly to the west, everywhere, everywhere around the world. I've been thinking a lot about shared experiences these days, about how millions, maybe billions of people all over the world are practicing social distancing or healthy spacing, physically distancing themselves from others in order to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus. We are so used to thinking of shared experiences involving things that we do together with people in the same space. But lately, we are having shared experiences across distances. I have a few colleagues who are encouraging their congregations and the people that they know to start a practice of pausing twice a day, maybe at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., to all pray for each other. Now, in a Unitarian Universalist context, we can interpret what it means to pray in the ways that make sense to us, whether that is offering a message to the God of our understanding, whether it is the Buddhist metta meditation, pausing to say, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be well, may you know loving kindness and be at peace or even the practice that some UU ministers use of holding still and bringing to mind the faces of those you know, sending each person your love and holding them in care. This is a kind of shared experience we could choose to create. Here's another shared experience. A few nights ago, I was part of a Facebook Live concert with the Indigo Girls. They played songs from a living room, and people all over the world sang along from their separate spaces and typed in the chat bar their requests, their questions, their favorite parts. It was kind of like a house concert, but the house was the whole of North America or maybe the whole of the world. They said at least one person tuned in from Australia. And when I think about it that way, I am reminded of these books I read when I was a kid. These books by Diane Duane, which I read when I was 12, and again when I was 18, and again when I was 25, and so on. And I think I'm gonna read them again this week. Remember, for all of us at any age, in the pursuit of comfort, that which makes us strong, now is a good time for returning to familiar things, whether that is books or movies or food or songs. These things ground us and they give us comfort. So these books of mine, the Young Wizards books, are set in the 1980s, and they're about two kids who are about 12 and 13 years old. And these kids learn to do magic 
They become wizards. But magic in these books comes with a condition. Every wonderful thing that you learn to do, you have promised to do for the service of all life. And it's not easy. These kids, 12 and 13 years old, just at the age when the average human is growing into a fuller capacity for abstract thought and complex ethical decision-making, Diane Duane gives these kids the power to affect thousands of lives. In one book, as the young wizards are trying to persuade one set of parents to give them permission to go and do a risky mission, and the parents are saying, no, 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 you are too young to risk your lives. We are your parents and you are staying put. The kids use their magic to take everyone to the moon. They stand there, two young wizards, two skeptical parents, and they watch the earth rise over the horizon of the moon. As they watch, one of them says, there will be a time when anytime someone's elected to a public office, before they let them start work, they'll bring whoever was elected up here and just make them look at that until they get what it means. Maybe you remember what it meant the first time you saw a picture of the whole earth from space. Maybe you remember how it felt to see our world from afar. Maybe you have marveled in the years since at satellite imagery or those nighttime photos where you can see the tracings of light everywhere that human beings live. Maybe you have felt so small and also so profoundly not alone as you contemplate what it means to see this planet as a small warm house with a giant backyard where comets roam. It's one of those big feelings, the kind that makes your heart feel too full. And we have a lot of reasons to feel those big feelings right now. On my Facebook feed, there is an incredible outpouring of human creativity and generosity. There's music and art being shared online, technology that lets us take virtual walks through museums and national parks, Netflix watch party plugins so that you can create the shared experience of movie night across many separate homes. And there's good news for the natural world not only the reduction in fossil fuel emissions, not only the fact that in Wuhan, China, you can see the sky and hear the birds again after years of industry, but photos of the canals in Sardinia, which have dolphins in them again for the first time in 60 years, and swans swimming through Venice. My Facebook feed is full of wonder and beauty and laughter. And it's also full of the truth that this is still a pandemic. It's still true that even under the best circumstances and the most flattening of the curve that we can do, people will die. People have already died. That is simply a fact of life every day that we are alive, but it hangs heavy over us right now. And we know that people will struggle in the economic slowdown, possibly for years to come, and the way forward will be unclear for some time. And that frightens us. How are we to make sense of this and the beauty I think of Victoria Safford's words. There are little gold stars all amongst the bittersweet. It's all there, mixed up together. Last week, we read the poem Pandemic by the Reverend Lynn Unger, 
Her poem has been everywhere these last 10 days or so. And this week she wrote another poem titled, A Letter in Return. And how do you live and what are your fears during this crisis? What a question to surface after midnight from across the world. In your country, is it the time of day to wrestle with the existential and daily dreads until, like Jacob and the vicious angel, they concede to bless us? I am afraid that people I love will die. I am afraid that my child is inheriting a world so much harsher than what she deserves. I am afraid that desperate times call for desperate measures, and I am not yet desperate enough. Should I go on? I am afraid that people have wandered away from the very idea of truth. I am afraid that we have unlearned how to speak and how to listen. I am afraid that the fabric that holds us together is woven more loosely than I thought, and people keep slipping through. And how do you live? With grief, with fear, with laughter, with boredom, with glee, with contentment, with fury, with hope, with the firm conviction that no thing cancels any other thing out. Death does not cancel life. Grief does not cancel joy. Fear does not cancel conviction, nor any of these statements in reverse. Make your heart a bowl that is large enough to hold it all. Imagine that you are the potter, stretch the clay, cherish the turning wheel, accept that the bowl is never going to be done. So here is our calling in these times to make our hearts into bowls that hold all that is. To acknowledge and simply to be with the truth of the stars and the bittersweet, the beauty and the healing and the loss and the fear. To hold still, to stand on the moon and gaze at the earth and feel too heartful to bear and yet to bear it, because this is what love asks of us in these times. Please join with us in singing, Love Will Guide Us. Extinguishing our chalice. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light. The light we shall create separately and together at a distance until we gather in person again. Please join with us in singing our benediction. We will sing it through three times. your social distancing, washing your hands, caring for your heart, and reaching out for what you need and to offer what you can. Be well. We love you. <laughs>